gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful, so very thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to come together in this fashion and feast upon your word. I thank you, dear Lord, that you have made us worthy, not because of anything that we've done, but because of who we are in Christ. I ask that you would filter out any foolishness, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at blessedhopeforever.com. We're continuing on in our study of Second Thessalonians. We're going to try to wrap up chapter 2. Just to kind of recap, uh, chapter 1, uh, we saw that Thanksgiving was being given uh, by Paul and his companions for the faith of the Thessalon uh, those at Thessalonica, the believers there at Thessalonica, in the midst of uh, much persecution and suffering that was going on, in which uh, at at which time they many thought that they were going through that period known as the Great Tribulation. that they were counted worthy of the kingdom of God, not because they made themselves that way, not because they did anything to make themselves worthy, but because of who they were in Christ, according to what Christ had done. And then Paul then references the second coming when Christ would return from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that don't know God and who obey not, that is, they cannot hear the word obey, the intense form of the word hearing, who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and which uh, the result being everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints as well as admired in all them that believe. That God would be glorified in His saints, as well as admired in all them that believe. That God would be glorified in them according to His working and power, according to His good pleasure as they walked worthy of their calling, which is underscored by the word, grace you know folks there is a sim in all of its complexity there is a simplicity to all of this that many Christians miss that can be summed up in just that one word grace if you're a Christian who believes that grace is just something that, well, it's, you know, as I'm trying the best that I can to live uh, uh, the best life that I can live as a Christian uh, in, in hopes that I might be counted worthy, and God's grace helps me along to do that. I mean, if, if that's how you view grace, then you have a total misunderstanding of, of what grace is. You know, that maybe, uh, well, maybe I'll go to heaven, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll be raptured, maybe I won't. You know, by the grace of God, you know, if, you know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. It, you know, we tend to throw uh, terms around uh, such as salvation and, and so many other terms, sanctification, you know, without really understanding what it is that we're looking at, what it is that we're reading. what it, And I hope to try to, to in, in, and I'll probably totally make a train wreck of this, but I, I hope to try to go through the text from a, uh, from, some, from somewhat of a, a view of, of how others might take and read this from the perspective of, legalism or law keeping or uh, fleshly oriented service or, or that sort of thing 
the unlightened mind, the unlightened Christian going through the text and reading this, and how that I think that he might, or many, how that I, I believe many do, read this and, and what they gain from the text, which is a total misrepresentation of what the text is actually saying. I'm going to make an attempt to do that. I, I very rarely do that, but I will make an attempt to do that. So the description of this coming of the Lord being absolutely distinct, separate from the removal of the body of Christ in, in which none of these things described would occur, none of this fiery, uh, fire, you know, flaming fire taking vengeance on them. We don't see that in the rapture. I, I pointed that out. Uh, in, a, in a previous video. Then in chapter 2, we were introduced to the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, that man which is known, that we know as the Antichrist, which, you know, John only uses the term Antichrist. He's the only one that uses that specific term, but we know that that is talking about the Antichrist who would be revealed only after the church had been removed. Only after the church had been removed. And it amazes me, even to this day, the number of Christians, so-called Christians out there, who want to argue and debate and divide over the, the fact of, that, well, there's, there's, the rapture is just a, a man-made myth. You know, it started with John Darby or, you know, or someone else. You know they've they've so fractured all of this this truth into uh, and subdivided it into uh, various uh, different viewpoints that the simple truth of it is is missed. You know it can't it just can't be that the body of Christ is removed uh, because you know well uh, and I've heard people say Steve you know the the that that whole rapture thing you know that's just you know you y'all are just a bunch of cowards you know you're not willing to suffer you know for the sake of Christ when the the text makes it absolutely clear that that's that type of persecution that type of suffering is very unique and particular to that time period it is not uh, by any means anywhere near the suffering and the persecution that was taking place even back then during the, the time in which this letter was written or anything that you could possibly go through now. The time of Jacob's trouble, the, the 70th week of Daniel, the trip, what we refer to as the tribulation period will be a, a time of unprecedented horror and chaos, unlike anything that the world has ever seen. And we have no place, the body of Christ has no place in that period. Period. It just, it's, it's not even designated, uh, it's not even a designated uh, period for the church. The church has nothing to do with Daniel's 70th week. You know, it's not just that the Thessalonians who thought that they were, you know, perhaps they were going through the tribulation period. It's not that that was just in and of itself was, was wrong enough. You've got to look at, at the underlying uh, fact, fact of the matter that, that in, by doing so, by thinking that they were, they, I don't know how to put this except to say that they would not have thought that if they had had a solid uh, understanding of, if, if they had been grounded in the understanding of the fact that there was therefore now no judgment, no condemnation to those who were in Christ. That, and, and the nature of the church itself, the very nature of the church. You know, listen folks, to not be pre-trib. It's not, it's not that, well, okay, we're Christians that, that love pre-trib because we, 
we just well it just sounds better okay it, we like that better we, we love the idea of not being able to go through that great period of of, of trouble known as the time of Jacob's trouble. We, 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 so we choose that. It, fo folks, we didn't even choose this. This was laid upon us. It was pressed upon us by the Holy Spirit, particularly through Paul, that we have no place in that period. It's not that, well, we just prefer that. We just don't have any place in that period. So in chapter 2, then, we were introduced to, we're given a little glimpse, a little window into that period and into the man of sin, which would be revealed only after the Holy Spirit, the restrainer was, was removed, the gospel uh, the, of, by which we are saved is holding that back. And that despite appearances or what others were saying, these Thessalonians were not to be deceived into believing they were at that time going through that period. That Paul had reminded them of these things when he was with them personally, which we, which you can read about in first, in the first epistle to the Thessalonians, that this period would be marked by signs and wonders performed by a system a religious system, driven system of lies and deception, political and religious, lies and deception, which is in contrast to the truth, where that those who were deceived received not the love of the truth that they might be delivered, that God would send them strong delusion. That's not delusions, plural, folks. That is, send them a strong delusion, okay? It's my personal belief that that is that, that they, will, they will view someone else as the Messiah. They will accept a false Messiah. That they should believe the lie which would result in their destruction. And that they would actually take pleasure in their performing unrighteousness. And I pointed out in a previous video how that much of that that we see going on here is, re is reflected in what, what we see already taking place today in what is commonly referred to as, as mainstream Christianity or the Christian mindset. It practically mirrors the unlearned Christian mindset practically mirrors much of the attitudes and the characteristics of what we see that take what we see take place during that period. And I pointed that out. And I believe that comes out through the text very strongly. This is timely, folks. It was written just not just for the Thessalonians, but it was written for us. So they, they would actually take pleasure in their performing unrighteousness, which I, you know, it's it's it. I I can't. I'm sorry. I just can't read that as as well doing all the. You know, they're just taking pleasure in doing all this bad stuff. I think they're taking pleasure in doing what they think is right. Which brings us to verses 13 through 17, which conclude the second chapter. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. That's a perfect passive. That's always been loved. Um, let, me, let me play devil's advocate here, okay? I'm not very learned in the scriptures. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm a young believer in Christ. Maybe I'm an older, mature believer years wise in Christ and, I, and I've been subject uh, most of my life to uh, the, the, the more legalistic angle of Christianity which, which pretty much uh, proposes uh, on a constant basis suggests that we are accepted because we're, we make ourselves accepted because we're, we're loved because we make ourselves loved. You know, even we are sanctified because we have well sanctified ourselves. I am sanctified. I have set myself 
apart, you know. We, we, we turn it around, folks. We flip it around. We turn it on its head. We turn it upside down. We put the cart before the horse, and we make it everything about what we do instead of what God has done. So we're bound to always give thanks always to God for you, brother and beloved, and boy, I hope I'm beloved. I just hope God loves me. I read that and I go, well, I just hope God loves me because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Well, let's stop, okay? I'm reading those words and, and, and I'm, it's a little, un, a little on the confusing side. Beginning, you know, from the beginning he chose me because well, I know I chose him. So, well, therefore, since I know I chose, chose him, then, then I have to conclude then falsely uh, uh, you know, I have to, the only conclusion I can come to is, is that, well, God chose me because I chose him. I chose him. If I choose God, if I choose him, well, then I become one of those that God chose, which is, you know, folks, I don't even have words to describe just how ridiculous that that is. If we if God chose us based upon the fact that we chose God, then, well, then God didn't choose us. Okay, you can't put those two phrases together, those two sentences, in, in one sentence, you can't say both because both contradict one another. Okay? From the beginning chosen, well, He chose me to salvation uh, because I chose Him through sanctification of the Spirit. Well, so, you know, and I don't exactly understand what that means. Nobody's ever really explained that to me. You know, so, but sanctification of the Spirit. So, I, man, I've got to, I've got to do something here. I don't know exactly what that, that's saying i got to do, but I know i got to do something. But, but I'm going to read on. And belief of the truth. Well, see, there I believed. And I hope I, I hope I'm a believer. And I hope, I hope, you know, the, everything is turned back inwards, folks, on the, the one's self. Well, I sanctified myself. Or, or if you look at the word sanctified as being set apart, or it's from a root word, holy, I'm, I'm good, you know, maybe I'll be holy, maybe I won't. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. Well, see, I heard the gospel that I had to do something to be redeemed so that so he that's that's how he called me he called me I, I i saw the gospel was that i had to do something to be redeemed so i get that part to the obtaining of the glory of our lord jesus christ well i hope i do therefore brethren stand fast here we go see here we gotta stand fast we gotta stand fast if we don't stand fast we won't make it and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. You know, and I don't want to go on with that because I hate doing that, folks. I really do. It just I, it makes my spirit uncomfortable to even to even try to to play that that opposite side of that going through the text. We are bound. The reason we are bound to, the reason I am bound to always give thanks for you people, folks, is because God loves us. He loves you. He always has loved you. And that He's from the beginning chosen you, you didn't chose Him, to deliverance. The word is salvation, it's not eternal life. Sure, it is true that He from the beginning chose you, you know, to to heaven, okay? He elected you uh, and determined that you would be with Him forever. But that is not what our text is saying. In the context of what we're looking at, the word is deliverance. We are born again. We are redeemed to be saved, to be delivered, okay? The reason why we were redeemed was to be delivered. So from the beginning, He chose, he chose us to salvation, deliverance. Through what? The sanctification of the Spirit. Well, just the word of there shows you that it belongs to the Spirit. It's the Spirit's sanctification. We didn't sanctify ourselves. We didn't become a saint uh, in and of ourselves by any, anything that we did in and of ourselves. And belief 
of the truth. Don't miss out, miss the word and there. The word and connects the two thoughts. Okay? God hath. God hath. The first word, the first verse, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. In other words, the, even your believing in the truth was not something that, that it doesn't say the believer hath from the beginning chosen himself to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. If you follow what I'm saying here, that's not what the text is saying. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. How did he do that? How did he do that? He called you. Well, in order for that to occur, you have to be one of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. And folks, his sheep, his sheep will. His people will hear. Will hear the gospel. If, if they are one of his sheep, they will hear the gospel. To the obtaining of the glory, and I want you to highlight the word glory, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not our glory, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Possession of His, of his glory. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about glory before the end of the video. I've mentioned before the word glory is, is to, to, to have a proper estimation of, of something's value or true worth. Okay? Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions. Hold the traditions. The word there in the Greek means to, to seize, to lay hold of. It's almost, it's almost akin to harpazo in the sense that you're snatching something, you know, and gr grasping it, uh, clutching it, holding it tight. You know, if, if you had, I don't know if you, if, if, if you were hanging from a rope, uh, to keep from falling and and you were you oh, i guess maybe a better illustration would be a life preserver you're in the water you're treading water you're about to drown someone throws you a life ring and you grasp it okay that's what the word means to seize hold of therefore brother stand fast and seize hold of the traditions, the, the word there is teaching which you have been taught. Now, you, it is impossible to read those words, folks, without seeing the, a heavy emphasis being placed on the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. Whether by word or by our epistle, whether it's spoken or written, if it's truth, we're to seize hold of it. It doesn't make any difference as to how it's delivered. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, we see the, the, the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ in that statement. Which hath loved us. Now, wait a minute. I thought He already said that. Well, He did. Back up in verse 13. Beloved of the Lord. And here now He's saying it again. Folks, do you know He loves you? Because He's repeated Himself right here. Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting, that's forever, okay? Consolation. Not just consolation for a little while. Not just encouragement and coming alongside and comforting you for a little while. Everlasting consolation is god's word really that powerful that it can give us everlasting consolation even now yes it is and good hope that is guaranteed expectation that's not wishful thinking the world uses the word hope it defines it in the sense of well wishful thinking well i hope i get a new bass boat uh, well i hope i i hope i i married the right person i hope it's it's not wishful thinking. It is uh, absolute, guaranteed expectation of things to come. And He did it through what? Through what? Through grace. 
through grace. Comfort your hearts. That's the word is to call alongside parakletos. It's the Holy Spirit comforting us, our one comforter, the Holy Spirit, to invite, call alongside, comfort your hearts, and, and, and establish you that is strengthen, the word there means strengthen you in, in every, every good word and work. What is that? What does it mean? Every good word, word and work. The doctrine that you've been taught. Everlasting consolation. God has nothing against us. His only concern here... Folks, you cannot read these last few verses, verses 13 through 17, and see anything there for you to do except grasp hold of, lay hold of, seize hold of sound biblical doctrine. Not that, that, that if you do something that some of these things will be true, but that because these things are true, we're to seize or lay hold of that, those sound biblical doctrines truths stand fast hold the traditions which you've been taught and i believe that I, it's my personal belief that our lord has every desire to bring us to that point to where that we do that but there are some mysteries some unknowns here many uh it is true that 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 when we stand before the Lord, that we will, there will be an accounting for the life that we lived and how we built on Christ. But you cannot help folks but see the heart, the mind, the spirit of our Lord and what He desires for us. And it is not; it is it is a giant leap. It is light years away from what modern Christianity, a legal system based on human merit, would would suggest it is. that they, they continue to push this idea that the Christian life is primarily made up of, I mean, if they were to define it, try to define it uh, quite simply, they would say that the Christian life is, is, is striving for holiness, you know, trying to live the best Christian life that we can be, trying to live in a, in a way that is pleasing to God. What about already knowing that, that all these things are true? Everlasting consolation. God has nothing against you, you people, okay? I don't know. I, I know really practically none of you that are listening here personally. But if, if you were sitting on my front porch and, and we were sitting there sipping on some of Sue's sweet tea and we were having a conversation and we were fellowshipping about things of the Lord and you said to me, well, Steve, I, I don't know. I'm just not so certain that, that uh, my life is pleasing to the Lord. I'd say it is. Well, Steve, I'm not so certain. I just, I have doubts as to whether or not, you know, uh, I'm really a Christian. Or I have doubts as to whether or not, you know, I'm living a life that is pleasing to God. I have doubts as to whether or not I'll be raptured. I have doubts as to whether or not I'm doing the right thing. Whether it's in my job or my family, my marriage, my kids. I, I just have doubt. My life is just filled with doubt. And... I think that I would probably make it make some attempt at trying to explain to you just how little place doubt has in our life and walk and relationship with Christ. It's not that, that God doesn't, and I believe that He allows that, that doubt, that uncertainty, for a purpose, and that is to bring you to the point of realizing that you... We don't trust in ourselves, folks, okay? We are not our own Savior. And for the most part today, modern Christianity, and I don't mind telling you this, has flipped this thing completely around to where that it has made you, you're basically made you determined 
it is determined that it is it is in fact its own savior while at the same time claiming to believe in a in a savior in a deliverer it just doesn't make any sense folks are are we being saved or are we saving ourselves which is it you can't you can't believe both well it's oh steve you know you got to understand here steve it's it's got to be a combination of both it's a it's a it's a mutual endeavor it's it's a synergistic relationship he does his part i do my part and together you know the two parts come together as a whole and you know everything's fine That may be true to a certain extent when it comes to our growing in grace and knowledge of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But let me tell you folks right now, I've said this before and I'll say it again, it does not matter how you live. It, doesn't, it won't change the fact of the truth of the Word of God. You can live like God has something against you, but when He doesn't. You can live like God is, is not pleased with you when in fact He is pleased with you because He's not looking for... God is... God's... He's been propitiated. Okay? You stand in... inside the realm of Christ's finished work on your behalf. The reason He loves you, folks, is not because you're lovable. Sometimes I get to rambling. Sometimes I've had too much coffee. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. I just, folks, I just want you to try to understand that far from being some wish list, you know, of hopeful things that, that one would hope, you know, be true of them if, if only they'd somehow qualify, you know, by some means. Verses 13 through 17, the conclusion of our present chapter here, describes the natural result of what will naturally appear in the lives of God's people as they rest and abide in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Nowhere do you read some list of things that make all of this possible. What they were being told to do was to take hold of, seize, grasp firmly the teaching regarding the fact that these things were true and that they had always been loved by God, that God chose them from the beginning by setting them apart by the Holy Spirit from which their faith came, it, which their faith came to exist, because Christ died in their place, not because of anything they did, which would result, the result being a true estimation of Christ's value or worth. That is glory, His glory, not some estimation of their own value or self worth, or not some estimation of a misjudged. Uh, uh, value of Christ's worth, an, an underestimate of Christ's value or worth. And it, and it wasn't that they didn't have worth or value as believers in Christ, as God's children. Of course we have worth and we have value. But their value, our value, or our worth, our glory is bound up in what Christ has done. It's not in how we live. And they were to walk worthy of the gospel through which they were called. And the chapter ends with the reminder, again, we see it twice, of God's love in the person of Jesus Christ, who is God of very God. And that they even had, they had even then, as a present possession, by means of this grace, everlasting closeness and comfort and hope. 
Their comfort was eternal. Their hope was eternal. And that they, God would strengthen them in both His Word as well as Christ's working in and through. How do we, how we interpret these words, folks, when we're looking at this, how we interpret these words will always, always depend upon the extent to which we've been exposed to that truth, to, to which we've been enlightened to that which God says is true of every born-again believer in the person and the finished work of Christ. If you approach, if you just opened your Bible and you said, okay, you know, here's this Christian out here and he's, he's, he says, well, I feel like I need to read the Bible some, so I'm just going to open it up and point, close my eyes and point my finger, and he winds up here, okay? And, and, he, and he looks at all this and he reads through this and, and, and he doesn't understand he's been redeemed, reconciled, regenerated, justified, forgiven, accepted, sealed, chosen, indwelt, sanctified, made a joint heir in Christ, seated, that he's seated in the heavenlies, uh, hid with Christ in God. He's made a citizen of heaven. He's been given eternal life. He's been pro that God has been propitiated. He's been made the righteousness of God in Christ. He's been granted great promises too numer too too numerous to mention. I mean, made a conqueror that he always triumphs. He's made to stand. He's joined to the body of Christ. He'll never be God. God will never leave him nor forsake him. He's been he's been granted full assurance. He's been made a son of God. He's been given peace, given mercy. He's loved by God. If 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 there's no groundwork, if there's no foundation for all of that. When, when the believer comes and reads these words, folks, okay, if that's missing in that believer's life, well, then he's going to interpret this passage in a much different light. All of the work that he does in us in causing us to grow and reach out to others in service has the goal of bringing glory to Christ and worship from us. Glory to Christ and worship. True worship. True worship. But that's often replaced with false worship. False worship, which is the very thing that... that, that that really characterizes that period known as the Great Tribulation, folks. True worship is returning to God a true estimation and honor for who He is and what He's done. The only way we can know what He has done for us is through His Word. Once we have that truth about Himself, as well as ourselves, we need to know, we need to understand, we need to know who He is, we need to know what He's done on our behalf, we need to see God's estimation of us, His true assessment of us. We come to, not to the Word, not just to, to know our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to His Word to know ourselves, to know who we are. And once we've done that, well, then we can return that estimation back to Him. That's the meaning of John 4.24, which says God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And until we're freed from the false objects of worship to the true, we'll be held back. We'll be held back. Get this, folks. We'll be held back in, the most, in our most intimate area of spiritual growth, true worship. This was God's concern for the Thessalonians. Not that they made themselves acceptable before God. Not that they made themselves lovable before God. Not that they did anything. But that they grasped hold and stood firm in, in the truths of, of sound doctrine, that which was true of them, 
which that truth alone is transforming. It changes our lives. Truth does that. You know, it's, it's, it's a novel thing, but, you know, I guess. But that's what it does. Whether spoken or written, the same is true of us today. And this in the context of our Lord's coming to deliver us from a period marked by His return again, a second time, in judgment. Whatever their present circumstances, God's concern for these, these dear believers at Thessalonica was that they grasp hold of, they seize strongly, adhere to, sound teaching and folks whether i'm alive when our lord returns or whether he puts me to sleep before it i'll continue to be convinced that we are living at a time in which sound biblical doctrine is of little concern even to those who profess to know christ even those many of those who anxiously await his return for us well, I'm out of time, folks. I love you all. I truly do. I hope you're all staying safe out there. I hope you all had, had a great Labor Day weekend. I ask for your continued prayers in regarding the direction of this ministry. I ask that you would pray for all of those, our brothers and sisters out there going through tough times and circumstances who are hurting and suffering, whether physically or spiritually. I thank you for all your kind comments and your expressions of love and, and concern for me and this ministry. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.